Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. In this episode, I'll be speaking with Douglas Murray. Douglas is a best-selling author and award-winning journalist in the UK. He's the associate editor of The Spectator magazine and also associate director of the Henry Jackson Society, which is a think tank in London. And he writes regularly for The Spectator, Standpoint, The Daily Telegraph, The Daily Mail, The Wall Street Journal in Europe. And he appears regularly on the BBC and other media outlets. And he has spoken in the British and Dutch and Danish and European parliaments and at the White House. Uh, Douglas is, as you will hear, a very incisive critic of political correctness and someone who is unusually engaged and extraordinarily articulate on the problem of Islamism and our um, habit of capitulating to it. So it's a great pleasure to talk to Douglas. I, I should say to give you some context, that we spoke about a week ago, uh, right after the attacks in Paris, and we speak about the Syrian refugees in Europe, and uh, things have moved on a little bit in the U.S. in the last five days or so, so there's been an active debate on Syrian refugees coming to the U.S. I should point out that, that Douglas and I were speaking about the European context, which is different from the U.S. from a security point of view, that, as you'll hear, the vetting process for refugees in Europe is nearly non-existent. Uh, in the U.S., that does not seem to be the case. And, and this is an important difference. As you'll hear, I think our ability to vet these people, which is to say understand who is coming into the country and what their ideological commitments are, uh, is the most important thing to consider. Since Douglas and I spoke, there have been many strange and silly declarations, both on the right and the left, relating to this crisis. And what's especially depressing is that that the demagoguery has been coming from both sides. So we've had Donald Trump and Ben Carson and Ted Cruz say things like, I think Trump said there should be a registry for all Muslims and we should start closing mosques. We shouldn't let any of the Syrian refugees in. Uh, Cruz said we should let in only Christians. It's into the vacuum left by liberals that reasonable security concerns find this kind of expression. Because the reasonable concerns are being denied at every turn. For instance, the president has said that no refugees have ever become terrorists. But that's simply untrue. There are Somali refugees living in Minnesota who have gone to fight and wage jihad for al-Shabaab. So it is just factually false, morally blind, and politically stupid to treat this as a non-issue. And every time the president opens his mouth on this topic without describing the problem accurately, avoiding at all costs the noun Islam, never uttering the words Islamic terrorism, or political Islam, or Islamism, or even jihadism, the feeling of being lied to just becomes more and more galling. The Republicans are absolutely right to be outraged by this. And they're also completely crazy. So this is a terrible situation to be in politically. President Obama has offered pure sanctimony on this topic. He talks about American values and, you know, we're better than that and disparaging anyone who is concerned about security risks associated with these refugees as lacking in compassion and as failing to live up to American values. Step back here. Take take the personalities of the people on the right out of the equation. Is it crazy to express, as Ted Cruz did, a preference for Christians over Muslims in this process? Of course not. What percentage of Christians will be jihadists or want to live under Sharia law? Zero. And this this is a massive, in fact, it is the only concern when talking about security. If we know that some percentage of Muslims will be jihadists, inevitably, if we know we cannot be perfect in our filtering, if we know that a larger percentage will, if not be jihadists, will be committed to resisting assimilation into our society, then to know that a given refugee or family of refugees is Christian is a wealth of information and quite positive information in this context. So it is not mere bigotry or mere xenophobia to express that preference. I hope you understand I'm expressing no sympathy at all with Ted Cruz's politics or with Ted Cruz, but it is totally unhelpful 
to treat him, though he actually is a religious maniac, like a bigot on this point. This is a quite reasonable concern to voice. And the fact that we have a president who will not even name the problem is giving the right enormous energy that uh, we, we really don't want them to have here. So while we don't talk about the, the U.S. context directly with respect to the refugee crisis, you'll hear Douglas and I try to articulate a middle position here, which is understanding the real-world facts related to the migrant crisis, acknowledging that the immediate problem of global jihad is not a matter of migration. It's a matter of already radicalized citizens in all of these societies. In any case, Douglas is one of the best people on this topic. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. And now I give you Douglas Murray. Well, I have uh, Douglas Murray on the line, uh, which I have been uh, very excited about. Douglas, welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. It's great to be with you, Sam. Well, thank you for doing this. As you know, we were supposed to speak last week. I canceled on you twice, uh, one for a recording malfunction and one for a cold, which still lingers. But in the meantime, the jihadists of the world have produced further evidence, perhaps the best in anyone's memory, that we cannot live alongside them. And so they've given us even more to talk about. So, uh, but, but before yeah. we, we dive into that and um, get into all the areas of our shared interests, I, want, I just want to spend a few minutes to talk about your background, just to, for people who don't know who you are in my audience. When somebody asks you what you do, uh, how do you answer that question? I use the all-embracing uh, um, term writer, uh, mm. which is what I do. I've, I've been a writer ever since I've uh, uh, been an adult and a bit before. Um, I started off by writing about literature, which is my first love, and um, now in more recent years, for the last 15 years anyway, uh, have ended up writing um, by necessity, I think, rather than desire about politics, about international affairs, particularly about terrorism, particularly about security. Um, it isn't because I'm a political nut in particular. I think it's because I, uh, um, I think that you have to be involved in politics if you care about the culture. And I care about the culture. And uh, I'm very concerned and have all sorts of views on it, which I write about for a plethora of publications and, and books and so on. And, uh, and I am also a broadcaster, I suppose. I do a lot in the UK in particular, where I'm from, as I'm sure your listeners can tell from my accent. Uh, and yes, and I like to think I write about a very broad range of subjects. I do, but um, I suppose in recent years I've ended up being caught more and more writing about uh, the big issue of our time. I wish it would go away. I wish mm. it were possible for me to go back to writing about literature and about music and other things I love, but yeah. there we are. Needless to say, I share your feeling of boredom on this count. I just I view every moment spent in conversations of the sort that we're now going to have as a really an extraordinary opportunity cost. And it's, yeah. it's um, it really it's just lacerating to contemplate all the work that is not getting done and all the uh, amusement not being had because of uh, this distraction from the work of civilization. But uh, so how, what percentage of your time would you say you spend on the issue of Islamism and, and its um, problems? Well, I, um, I try uh, with my editors at various publications to have a deal that I write uh, an article about something I love for every article I write about something I hate. Um, mm. The 50-50 quota never works out these days quite that much, but uh, I did I did manage to write a piece just before Friday that came out in one of the magazines I'm at, the Spectator magazine here in the UK, which is our oldest weekly magazine. Uh, I managed to write a piece on one of my favorite artists, 20th century artist Rex Whistler, who was killed in Normandy in 1944 on his first day of action. Mm. Um, but was a wonderful artist. I managed to write about that, and I was I was actually focusing on a review of the new two volumes of T.S. Eliot's complete work in a new critical edition, which I was really hoping to get around to this week. But once again, I've um, I'm afraid I've spent uh, time all my time uh, on uh, on these issues, and uh, I suppose I mean I can't moan about it too much. One could always stop, but. Um, uh, my hope has always been that there would be lots more people who would say the things you say, say some of the things I say, 
and that they would come along in greater and greater numbers and uh, that basically I could retire. (laughs) (laughs) Alas, alas, they don't come along in sufficient numbers. But as I say, it's still my hope. Maybe by the time I'm 40, I'm 36 at the moment. Maybe by the time I'm 40, I can can retire from the scene. I doubt it. Yeah, well... um... I can't quite say that I wish for it because um, for, for the li- listeners who are not familiar with you, they should know that watching you debate on these issues, probably on a, on any issue, but I think I've only caught your debates on this topic, is just a thing of beauty. And uh, happily, YouTube <laughs> YouTube is now full of examples of you laying waste to your opponents. So um, don't re- <laughs> don't retire until some competent disciple can uh, t- take your mantle. <laughs> Find me so, some. Find yeah. me some. <laughs> so, okay. Well, we seem to be uh, pulled to the topic by a uh, tractor beam here. You know, obviously, we're gonna we'll talk about Paris. Uh, we're now talking on Monday, the Monday after the Friday, where over a um, hundred and thirty, I think, now people were murdered in Paris by jihadists. Well, I, I want to get into the, the kind of the larger footprint of our concerns here, which is. It's really free speech and the failures of liberalism to protect it and the, the problem of Islamism and, and, and Western masochism in response to it. And also the, just the related problem of, of identity politics and imaginary grievances that millions of people find captivating. So there's, there's much more than just mm. AK-47s going off in polite society. But um, mm. let's get into that. I think I, I, I always burn a lot of fuel in talking about this, know, knowing who my audience is, uh, trying to convince someone that there really is a problem here. Now, that probably is not so necessary in the immediate aftermath of Paris, but um, mm. people seem to think that people like ourselves are exaggerating the nature of this mm. problem. And so I, I just give that to you as a doorway into this topic, and uh, we'd just love to hear what you have to say. Well, you know, the, the, um, there are people who exaggerate the problem, um, and there are many people who underestimate it. Um, as you say, I mean, in the wake of an atrocity like that a couple of days ago, it's, it's unlikely many people are going to underestimate it, but they, they, there still are some who do. Um, I, I would say that one of the most interesting ways of, of looking about this is, is one that the American scholar of Islam, Daniel Pipes, says quite often, which is that the striking thing uh, in this whole area is that it is a one-way street, pretty much. Um, Very few people say, I used to be worried about Islamic extremism, but I'm not anymore. Mm. More people say, more every day, many more every year, I'm getting worried about this. And that is something that in a way is a signal for hope. It means that people are paying attention to what is happening in the world. They're starting to join the dots. Late, sure. But they're starting to join the dots and they are concerned about it. And as I say, I I I agree with that. I think it is a one-way street. Mm. I've never heard anyone who said, you know, I used to worry about the persecution of religious minorities within Islam, but I don't anymore. Um, Nobody says, you know, it used to be worse, Islamic extremism, 20 years ago, and so on. Right, right. So, so all of these things, in a way, are, are, are very bloody parts of a very bloody learning curve. And I suppose for those of us who care about ideas and about writing and thinking and speaking and the idea of free inquiry and of debate, I suppose one of the most saddening things about all this is simply that it seems to require events always rather than reason Mm. to propel most people into realizing there's a problem. Um, And that is very disconcerting. It's very sad because obviously we would wish that uh, uh, most people listen to reasonable argument, listen to reasonable summaries of the problem and, and, and acted and thought accordingly. But but that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and recent events will, I think, just bear that out further. Yeah, yeah. Cause it, it, people have a hard time taking our enemies at their word. It's, it's, it's really mm. no, nothing. Speech doesn't count, even when the speech entails 
a crystal clear discussion of what they plan to do, want to do, aspire to do, mm. if only had, they had the power to do it, and the incremental evidence ever accruing that they are accomplishing many of these aims. It's mm. just a... Um, I find that secular people tend to doubt that anyone really believes what they say they believe. They just they, yes. they, they, oh, they, absolutely. they just don't they can't imagine anyone really believes in paradise. And I, I I've I've told yeah. listeners this many times, but I, I have literally met anthropologists who have told me that no one believes in paradise and no one is ever motivated by the content of their religious doctrines. It's, it's always some <laughs> other reason. And it's just it, you're, when yeah. you're in the presence of someone like that, and this was at a academic meeting where we were debating these issues and this was I mean, this is the kind of thing this person said in public. Mm. I I've named this person before. I don't know why I'm being sheepish about it now. It's Scott Atran. Scott Atran is is a, is an anthropologist who is incredibly influential. He's he gets meetings with various governments and he uh has, has inserted himself very much into the dialogue about terrorism and Islam and all the rest, but he is someone who told me in private even, both in public and in private, when I said, listen, just level with me. We're standing in the men's room at the Salk Institute, and he said, he looked me in the eye, he said, nobody believes in paradise. And so he's either mm. pr uh, presuming to be a mind reader because uh, <laughs> and, and knows that everyone is lying, even those who are willing to blow themselves up, you know, and even those who are willing to celebrate their children once they do. Uh, mm. You know, it's, it's, it's the greatest deception in human history, if that's the case. Yeah, I mean, that's, look, I've for many years marveled at the capability of reasonable and intelligent people to put uh, reasons into the mouths of terrorists that the terrorists never asked for. Hmm. And also to come up with increasingly bogus uh, and now demonstrably wrong explanations for why things are happening. You know, um, my think tank, the Henry Jackson Society in London, we've uh, analyzed every single person convicted of Islamist-related offenses in America and in the UK in the last 15 years. It's kind of an ongoing project. It's the only project of its kind that actually just does the statistical analysis of people. And one of the reasons we did that was that some years ago I got fed up with hearing people saying, for instance, that terrorists that we're dealing with were, for instance, suffering from a lack of education. Mm. Obviously not true, demonstrably not true. But I used to demonstrate it wasn't true by giving the anecdotal cases. You know, uh, the murder of Daniel Pearl was at the London School of Economics. Uh, the people who blew up Mike's bar in Tel Aviv were from King's College in London. Uh, the 2009 Detroit bomber was from University College London. I'm just focusing on about a square mile of London. Mm. So um, I used to give those, they were anecdotal, so I thought well, it's worth it's worth doing this in a statistical analysis. So we had to enter all the hundreds of cases. And good, you know, you, you can show this now. Actually, the terrorists in America and in Britain that have been convicted, we're not talking about putative cases or disputed cases or anything, we're talking about people who've been convicted, are disproportionately well-educated, are disproportionately uh, uh, likely to have attended university, disproportionately likely to have done further education. Mm. So... You know, one by one, you can shoot down these things. It's it's laborious. It takes a long time. It's very costly. But you you, you can shoot these things down. And uh, I think that we are in the process of that at the moment. And you don't hear that so much anymore. You you sure you do from some people. I mean, Tariq Ramadan, a long foe and very close enemy of mine, was on the radio in Britain this morning saying that it was to do with like integration, education, a whole load of other things. But fewer and fewer people buy that. I would I would argue. So what this means is you whittle them down to what is the point? What is the cause? What is the propulsion? And this, I, I say, is a, is a long and slow trudge that people in liberal Western democracies are making towards the truth. And it's, um, it's going to take a long time, but things like this do take a long time because there's so many reasons for us to want to avoid the truth because it's it's very worrying. It has all sorts of very serious implications. And one thing lurking in a lot of people's minds may be, oh, my God, if that's the case, then we're screwed. Yeah. And um, there are other things that make this so difficult to talk about. So, I, For instance, I was noticing even in your even in this conversation, some of the mad work of liberal 
demagogues or you know, people who Majid Nawaz and I are now calling regressive leftists mm, has yeah. was effective even in the way I was listening to you. So, for instance, you brought up Daniel Pipes. And mm -hmm. um, now Daniel Pipes is someone who I don't know directly. I've, I've never met him. We, I, we've had some email correspondence in the past. I've read some of him, but I haven't. It's, it's been some years since I've followed him. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not totally familiar with his stuff. I can't really, I, I, which is to say that if someone mentions Daniel, Daniel Pipes, as you just did, there is uh, between me and his name some residue of Mm -hmm. uh, charges of bigotry that have got into my head in the same way that no doubt charges of bigotry against you or me have gotten into the heads of mm -hmm. others. And yeah. so I noticed that, that there's kind of a, a bad odor associated with his name. And I could, <laughs> I, I could name many other people for whom this is true and for whom it is almost certainly unwarranted. Right. But yeah. I, I just don't have the time to read everyone's books at this point or to, to watch everything they've said on YouTube. And so Mm -hmm. uh, not being able to vet some of these people, I have declined to make common cause with them. And there's, there's another ex right. example of a person you, I know, have collaborated with before uh, who, uh, you know, I've seen one of his talks and found him uh, really impeccable, but he's often uh, vilified as being a bigot. And that, that's Mark Stein, right? So I'm, I'm, right. So oh, I'm, yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I'd like to ask you about um, both of them, but or you can decline to to talk about their cases, but I, I I just I just want to point out how insidious this is because here are people who I just simply haven't had the time to read in any depth, and yet yeah. because people have called them bigots, I am now wary of making common cause with them, aligning myself with yeah. them, for even forwarding their stuff when I happen to see it and like right. it if it's an article, because I don't know how that's going to blow back on me dealing with my own yeah. charges of bigotry. Yeah. If I can say so, I mean, I mean, you have, as it were, a bigger problem than I have on that because you, uh, I think, self-identify as a liberal, I suppose, as a left-winger, don't you? And you know, we, we, um, should, we should get into that because at this point, I'm not even sure what that means. We should just no, we should go through the checklist. No, I'm not sure what it means either. I'm not sure what it means either anymore. Um, and, uh, and, and so on. But I've never, never particularly cared for that. Um, I, um, in all sorts of ways, regard myself as a liberal, in all sorts of ways are regarded by some people as being left wing, but I don't particularly care about it. And I think I'm more identified as being a right winger or a small C conservative and so on. And I don't, I sort of don't mind about the labels anymore. And to tell the truth, I know it might be different in America, mm. but in Europe and in Britain these days, I think that these things are mattering less and less and we're losing patience with this game because you see, if the whole game is played on the left's terms, as as it were, then uh, first of all we'll lose um, because there are there is no possibility of confronting very large societal issues only with one fragment of the political uh, spectrum, and uh, it's also very uh, uh, clear, I would say, by now that the, the and I mean look, I've got you know I say some of my best friends on the left. But it is very clear to some of us that the left has been the problem on dealing with these issues. It is the left that has been throwing around mm -hmm. willful and I think deliberately knowing that they're not true allegations against people. Mm. You know, I've often said that with the modern left, since certainly the end of the Cold War, they've basically had a supply and demand problem. They want racists, they want Nazis, they want bigots. And actually, thank goodness, certainly in my society, I think in yours, they're in pretty uh, short supply. And so these people um, have to find them. They want, they want a supply of bigots and racists and fascists. And actually, the supply is extremely small. And the people that, are, that they demand are, are too small in number to really uh, uh, um, uh, give them enough of a political identity. So they stretch it out. They've deliberately used as offensive terms as they could and used them of people that they must know do not fit that mm. uh, 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 label. And I think the result is, by the way, among other things, that they have denuded certain terms of any meaning and that this is going to come back and bite the left in a big way. And I can see this happening in Europe all the time at the moment. You know, the accusation of racism, for instance, I don't think it's going to wash for very much longer. I mm. just don't. Mm. Uh, nobody cares. 
as much as they used to about that because they have seen the left use it on everyone. I've seen it for years. I've seen I've seen my black friends called racists. Right. I've seen my black friends called sellouts and coconuts and all sorts of things. I've seen the most vile racial abuse of racial minorities by the left. And I don't care about this anymore. It's too late to be uh, uh, willing to be blackmailed by people who are fundamentally insincere in their insults. Yeah, and it, but what's there is still seems to be a mystery here because I agree with you, and it's something I've often remarked on that the the tactics being used here are just shockingly dishonest. But the commitment to using such tactics, the fact that people see no ethical problem in accusing someone of being a racist who they know isn't a racist, or a fascist who sure. they know isn't a fascist. There, there, there must be some underlying urgency uh, motivating that. They must think that the, the ends justify the means in some uh, sense. Of and, course, it's politics. But what's amazing is that they are, in the, certainly on the topic of Islamism, functioning as de facto apologists for theocracy. Sure. Uh, so this is it's the fact that they don't see this, the fact that this or that they don't care about this, the fact that identity politics and their concern for you know, generic brown-skinned people or generic mm. immigrants trumps any concern they, they should otherwise have about real fascism and real theocracy and real human rights abuses, that still strikes me as somewhat mysterious. I, I feel like I'm in the presence of people mm. who have made some kind of reverse Faustian bargain, where it's, it's like they've sold their souls to the devil and they got stupid in return. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so yeah. like, like, I mean, just, just before... The atrocities in Paris, the previous news story was the, the students at Yale, where we just saw these, these mm. students, you know, and their shrieking narcissism. I mean, these, mm. the, these are among the most privileged kids in human history, and they became yeah. moral and psychological invalids in response to a polite email about Halloween costumes. Yeah. So something is, well, is very strange on the left right now. Well, what the hell is going could on? I, could I give one explanation of what it is? Uh, another, <laughs> another conservative who I, I'm sure will, would 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 make you tingle with with slight fear, as mm -hmm. it were, if I mentioned his name. But an American conservative who used to be on the left and moved very much to the right, David Horowitz. Mm. Um, uh, uh, he said some years ago something very interesting uh, about 1968. Now, I mean, you know, we, we might have all sorts of issues about this, but the. He said something to me I think is far more true today, which is that the surprising thing is not that young people would rebel. Young people always rebel. This is uh, uh, something that young people do. The surprising thing is why did the adults give in? Now, I think this is far more uh, relevant to, 19, to, to today rather than 1968. The amazing question which hovers over Yale University is, why do the adults sit and take it and the kids can run rampage? Why, what, what's happened to... And this is the really large problem which, uh, uh, which, which Islamists and other terrible people are simply taking advantage of. Uh, um, somebody needs to say to the shrieking girl who's effing and blinding at her professor, you know what? You're not at a home. This is not a home for you. It's a university. It's a very different thing. And what's more, if you cannot cope with Halloween costumes, then you've got no place at a university because you're going to have no chance of dealing with quantum physics or Shakespeare or Heidegger if Halloween spooks you out this much. <laughs> you're a useless person and you're going to go into a useless career because if you're a lawyer, and you have gone to Yale, but you're too sensitive to hear about rape cases, you're not going to be able to represent anyone in a court of law. So you're no use for the law. You're no use for literature because you might read a novel which will trigger you. You're no use for the sciences. You're no use for anything. And that's what the adults should be saying. They should be telling the kids to grow up. And the adults have lost their confidence. And that is the most striking thing to me. And, mm. and, and let me just say one other thing about this. This whole thing of the of, of the, the 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 weirdo sexual obsession uh, transgender trans polygender identify cis 
I've got a <laughs> penis, but I can still win Glamour Woman of the Year award. Mm. And who are you? If not only not only do you have to respect me as a woman, if you say I'm not an entire woman despite the fact I've got a penis, still you're a bigot. And <laughs> and then and then you've got to find them. You've got to find Caitlyn Jenner attractive. If you don't find her attractive, you don't want to sleep with Caitlyn Jenner. You're an even bigger bigot. This is what. <laughs> and actually, to cite the other person you just said that would trigger you, Sam Harris, mm. Mark Stein said this the other day. This is the conversation we're having when the Mullers will nuke us. Everyone will be discussing whether somebody is transgender despite (laughs) the fact they've not had any operation. There's a woman in Britain called Jack Monroe, a fatuous far left wing (laughs) so-called anti-poverty campaigner, totally talentless individual. This blogger uh, 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 has recently come out as transgender. She says, by the way, she's not going to do anything about it. We just have to call her transgender and regard <laughs> her as transgender, but she's not going to get a penis put on her and she's not going to have her breasts uh, reduced or taken off or anything. And she's not going to. We've just got to start calling her um, a non sexual pronoun. Now it's <laughs> theirs, but Jack Monroe, the pink newspaper. I'm gay, I read some of this crap. Uh, the pink newspaper ran a story about Jack Monroe becoming transgender because she says she is. I think she just wants a bit of publicity. Uh, they run a piece about her and they've got to say there. Jack Monroe wrote a piece on their blog saying that they, when they was younger, I mean, it's an assault <laughs> on the language apart from anything else. Anyone who cares about our delicate and beautiful language should turn away now. But we'll all be discussing whether somebody who hasn't got a penis can be a man and whether somebody who has got a penis can be Glamour Woman of the Year when the Islamists come in with Kalashnikovs. It's pathetic. (laughs) It's a breakdown in our society and you have to rectify it. Oh, that is hilarious. Well, um, for those who uh, may just be introduced to you again for the first time in this podcast, there you have a taste of the um, kind of ire that Douglas is able to summon in the midst of a debate. and. That's a gear, unfortunately, which I don't have and um, wish I did. I think perhaps that part of my brain was damaged by too much meditation. But uh, <laughs> it, but, is bad for you. Yeah. it is bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's certainly bad for this. And uh, you, you have this gear and uh, Hitch obviously had it. And it is um, incredibly useful. So keep that well oiled. Uh, so I'd, <laughs> now to the substance of what you just said, though. But first of all, the, the fact that you're gay, does that give you any more freedom to say what you just said or are you also going to get hammered for that no, litany doesn't give you doesn't give doesn't give you any more freedom i say it's all about politics don't be fooled uh homophobia transphobia islamophobia all these things are shut up and let me speak and don't think anything different from me i've never had a single bit of credit from the left for being a gay man opposed to radical Islam. Of course not. Why would they? I don't want it, by the way. I don't want their pats and their pandering and their um, and, and, and anything like that. But, uh, uh, um, you know, I, I, see, I see all of these things used against people all the time. It's politics. Um, and they don't really care about anything else. They never yeah. did. Let's focus on that for a second, because in terms of the anti-intellectualism of all this, this for me, it's really the core. It's, it, people are focused on what you think more than how you think. You know, if, if, if you do not think what's been prescribed in the canon of your side of the political spectrum, this presents an immediate problem for you. And any, and any train of thinking that seems to test those boundaries or, God forbid, leads into some area of novel thought or a, a, a position that doesn't align with all of the, of the predictable ones on the checklist of left and right, then you are anathematized. And, and yet what you think is not what is important here. It's always how you think. It is how you reason. It is the, the fact that you're available to good chains of evidence and argument. And if you're not available to those things, you're, you're simply not in touch with reality in an ongoing way, and you are an unreliable witness to every subsequent mm-hmm. event. I mean, all you have is dogmatism. Yeah. If, you, if, if your views are not on the table mm. to, be, to be modified by new evidence and new arguments, if you push a conversation in a direction that is uncomfortable, and I, again, I, I find this especially on the left, uh, although it is, it, it's similar to what 
happens in a religious context when you begin to challenge the veracity of scripture or, or any other dogma. Mm. If, if a reliable chain of reasoning and evidence begins to push up against the boundary of some leftist shibboleth, you just reap a storm of uh, personal attacks and lies, and there, sure. there are no rules. Sure, but I mean, why would there be? I mean, these people, as I say, they're fighting for everything that they think they believe in. Uh, why would they not uh, um, play as dirty as they like? I mean, I think a more interesting thing is, is it where, why people don't do it back. We don't do it back for a very clear reason, which was that we think there should be some decency in this world. But, um, you know, I, I or you could at any point decide to turn around with as frivolous uh, attacks on our enemies as they do on us. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, we could perfectly easily turn around and say, you know, the problem with Glenn Greenwald is he's such a paedophile. Right. He is right. such a paedophile. And, you know, the problem with Reza Aslan is he just can't stop shagging kids. We could yeah. do that. Yeah. It would be as frivolous and as untrue as their constant smears of their opponents. But we don't do it. Why? Because we have a belief in the truth. Because we don't want to pump out lies simply to further a political agenda. Because we've got a bit of decency in this world. And I think we have to hang on to that. And I'm very glad that, by and large, people of our thinking do. Let's talk about that. I mean, in, in what sense are you are you a conservative? Several different ways. I mean, one is that I, I've got a very conservative instinct, and I I don't I'm not I don't like the term progressive. I don't like I don't like this term. I don't like the idea. I don't like the idea that I mean, progressing towards what? Um, I think a lot of the fundamental things of progressive so-called politics are uh, are things that should make people suspicious. Um, uh, all sorts of things, uh, 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 the idea of, um, of a leveling out of society, of, uh, uh, of fighting until a day when everyone is utterly equal and so on. There are parts of it that are true and, uh, and, uh, and are good and large parts of it that are obviously, uh, uh something else. Uh, I believe in, in, I, I was conservative because I, I, I believe in retaining the things that are good. And um, uh, and think very often that a lot of so-called progressives want to trample on a lot of those things. I think, I suppose, in another way also, I believe in tradition and I believe in custom. Um, that There are some things that are good because uh, uh, we have been doing them for a long time and they reflect a wisdom of experience and collective experience. And that uh, that in itself is a is a part of politics that should be deemed to be at least something that has worth mm. um so so a, a, a lot of things that is I, this i would by the way say i mean this is different to a considerable degree to a lot of american conservatism and certainly to a lot of american republicanism yeah. in britain most small c conservatives like me uh, um would you know see in edmund burke uh, for instance, and somebody we admire, right. and, um, and and that is, I think, rather different in the American tradition. Burke, I suppose, had one of the most important uh, statements of my form of conservatism, which is that he saw um, our, our role as being uh, to to form a and a role of a culture to to, to form a unity and a pact between. Uh, those who have gone before, those who are alive now, and those who are going to be born, mm. and that the, that you have to be very careful about destroying any particular end of that pact or breaking the pact, and it's it's that that I think would make me conservative, passing on laws and traditions which have seen uh, my predecessors well and have done well for them and giving them. Uh, justice and and meaning and, and and all sorts of other things and security, and passing them on. Not, I suppose, this is the uh, the crucial difference with the left. I mean, not believing that one can create a utopia uh, um, in politics. I think this is a this is a very important point, if I say so myself. Politics, it seems to me, is taking on too much significance in our societies these days. It might be to do with the decline of religion. It, 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 there are other factors, but you know, I hear of people who 
in Britain, uh, uh, when the l l recent election happened, the Conservatives won. All these people of the left, were, there was a, a colleague of mine, a spectator, and I had a competition to find the most ludicrous response from the left. But there were people who were claiming they had cried every day. You know, they'd woken up every day since the election, remembered it wasn't a horrible nightmare and burst into tears. My view is this is a totally wrong-headed way to think of politics. Politics is not about everything to do with your life. It's about a bit of your life and the orderly governance of your society. But it's not the, the, the means through which you make uh, uh, people good. Mm. It's not the means through which you make people happy. I mean, when people, when people think that politics is going to make them happy, or they, I think they must be taking something. No, your, your personal life makes you happy. Culture makes you happy. I mean, it was Alexander Hetzen, I think, who said you know, that, that culture and art and the summer lightning of human happiness are the only guarantees we have. Who, who, would, who would want you know, a Republican contender to give them that? Mm. Who would want a Democrat contender to give them that? It's, it's a crazy misreading of the role of politics. So um, I, I do worry about that uh, I, I, on the left. I think it is among the things that makes me, makes me conservative. I think it may be just a problem with translation here across the pond, because certainly 90% of uh, what you described as the um, the terrain of conservatism, I, I certainly can align with. But all of that, once you bring it into an American context, is vitiated by a level of ambient religiosity and bamboozlement that is just, you know, when you talk about tradition in Alabama or even in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. tradition is yes. of the sort that would prevent you from believing in evolution, right? And it would right. No, that's the problem. Yeah, and it would sure. prevent you from believing that's a big in it. Problem. Yeah, even if you're a yes. pr presidential candidate who happens to be a Yale-trained surgeon, right? I mean, it's, it's, so it's yeah, it's yeah. Uh, well, that's that. That, by the way, can I say without wanting to sound too nationalistic, <laughs> <laughs> is this is that we are very lucky in uh, in, in Britain. Uh, rather specifically in England, and, and I suppose in Scotland as well, about Wales and rather less so Northern Ireland. We're very lucky in that the form of religion which we've inherited is a wounded form of Christianity. Mm. Um, it's a cultural form of Christianity, undoubtedly, but one in which belief actually is, is, is you know, is not that important. Um, it, it's, it's quite different from the Christianity of parts of America. Um, I suppose the nearest you'd get, you might get on the coast, the form of Episcopalianism that, 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 was, that was close to it. But it's not remotely fundamentalist. The mm. idea of being a fundamentalist Anglican is, is, is so ludicrous that you, you, no one would put the two words together. Uh, and that's partly because of the fact that Anglicanism, Protestant Anglicanism in the United Kingdom and England, was sorted out the church-state problem some centuries ago. And made a um, made a made a, an interesting uh, reconciliation, whereby effectively uh, the state owned the religion, <laughs> mm -hmm. but but the religion had a place at the table that was very important. But that that all sorts of compromises happened that have meant that by the twentieth century, um, it isn't it isn't remotely weird. By the way, I mean there's, there are books about this now. Uh, called there's one only a few years ago from the. The uh, the rector of the University Church at Oxford University called um, ang uh, called um, Christian atheist. Um, quite a lot of people would regard themselves as that. I call myself mm. a Christian atheist mm. because, um, um, as various Italian philosophers have said, that's the product of what you are. You believe it or not is is important, but uh, you are a product of that. Just as there are Jewish atheists, and indeed, as we now know, thank goodness, and uh, more in number, Muslim atheists. Mm. But the, but what they've come from. It is not something that necessarily can be completely ignored or necessarily should be completely ignored. If there is worth in it, then that itself should be um, should be considered. That's why I don't I don't like the wholesale ridiculing of all religion that some people I think of it too glibly do. So would you detect some daylight between yourself and uh, me and some of my colleagues I mean, I, for a very long time? Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, mm. and I were being 
described essentially as a four-headed atheist. We're the new atheists. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, there are differences between, certainly yes. differences of emphasis, but also just differences of you know, what we believe to be true or important there. But um, the generic picture of a very strident attack on all religion yes. in principle because it's so much of it, really all of it that's relevant to us, rests on a claim about the divine origin of specific books, right. which is on its face ridiculous and disproved mm -hmm. by the you know, the contents of every page of those books. It, it sounds like you, you aren't fully aligned with that project. You no, know, I'm feel, not. I, feel, I, talk I'm, about that. I'm not for various reasons, but I mean, one is, and I, I don't apply this by any means to you or to... Uh, to Christopher, um, hmm. I, I, I have a I have a problem with something that, as it were, some of your admirers have ended up doing, which is to say the problem is all religion. And you see, and I find this a weaselly way out. I think this is one of the ways in which people avoid the problem. Uh, look, I, I can understand well, why people think it. So but, just to be clear, that the problem is all religion as opposed to the problem to, of Islam. We've got a real in this problem. Oh, exactly. Yes. Well, yes. Um, well, if I haven't and, been um, energetic clear. enough on, and, on spelling out why I, that's confusion, I have to yeah. get less sleep at night. And, but... <laughs> and Christopher also yeah. was very clear about that. I have a um, residual, um, I am sure you won't mind me saying this, um, uh, a little problem with Richard uh, Dawkins uh, that uh, has an amusing uh, background, if you don't mind me, oh, me uh, relaying it for a few minutes. Richard um, and I were meant to be doing a debate a few years ago at the uh, Cambridge Union, where um, uh, I think the plan was that it was him and me beating up a couple of imams, you know, <laughs> which sounded great to me. I was yeah. looking forward to it enormously. Of course, as you know, actually, Muslim religious leaders never actually turn out for debate. I mean, I don't know if you've ever debated. Well, I mean, they just they mm. just don't debate. Mm. Various sort of scholars and pseudo scholars and, and uh, publicity seekers do. But generally, the imams uh, steer clear of it for a very clear reason, which is that they know that they'll um, they'll, they'll look like idiots, and uh, what they uh, believe or pretend to believe will be uh, disproved. I mean, they're they're right to avoid the debate uh, on their own terms. Mm. But uh, anyhow, I was looking forward to this. It turned out that uh, we didn't have any imams, uh, but we did have uh, Rowan Williams, uh, I I uh, sheepish uh, mm -hmm. uh, former Archbishop of Canterbury, and. Uh, uh, Tariq Ramadan, as I mentioned before, a very dear enemy. Uh, but unfortunately, Richard, I, th I think it was Richard's fault, that the motion became stronger and stronger and harder and harder, as it were. And it became that there's no place for religions in the 21st century. Mm. And I thought that was a preposterous uh, thing. And so I switched sides and, um, and won the debate for the other side. <laughs> despite the fact I couldn't uh, talk to either of my right. people on the other side because I'd been so rude about the archbishop and and so vitriolic about Tariq Ramadan that I think we agreed that I would speak last. He said, uh, he said he wouldn't have that, Tariq, because he said, uh, you will spend the whole time attacking me. And I gave him my word I wouldn't. Uh -huh. I only spent half the speech attacking him. <laughs> but but, the, but, but the, I tell you this because it, 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 there's, there's another segue of this, which is that I've also been a bit rude about Richard in that he, um, I think, now he has changed on this, but certainly some years ago, he used to give Islam a bit of a soft ride in compared to Christianity. Mm. And there's a famous interview, which he did on Al Jazeera with somebody called Mehdi Hassan, where um, uh, Mehdi Hassan read the opening of chapter two of The God Delusion, an amazing piece of rhetoric about how uh, God is, the, the God of the Old Testament yeah. is the most vile, appalling, uh, disgraceful, disgusting figure in all of fiction. So this was read to him on Al Jazeera. And uh, the interviewer said to Richard Dawkins, uh, you know, you believe that of the God of the Old Testament? He said, yes, I do, quite rightly. Uh, the interviewer said, and you believe that of the God of the Christians? And Richard said, I do, quite rightly. And then the interviewer said, and what about the God of the Quran? And this little flicker went across Richard's eyes. And he said, uh, the God of the Quran, I know, I know less about. And I, uh, I wrote a piece after this saying that this wasn't surprising and a surprising was, uh, response from Richard Dawkins. Uh, uh, Professor Dawkins was simply demonstrating the survival instinct of his species. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, was, I was so pleased with this uh, gag. I reported uh, it. I, I retold <laughs> it everywhere I went. And um, ri ri Richard quite rightly took exception to this and, uh. Uh, and said when I next saw him that I owed him an apology. And I gave him a sort of half half asked apology. Uh, but uh, because he has actually, and did actually later in that interview, to be fair to him, 
you know, ridicule the idea that, you know, uh, 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 Prophet Mo uh, 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 flew around on a half human horse mm -hmm. and all this kind of crap. And so um, uh, he did, he did go into it a bit more, but, but I knew exactly what was going on in that moment and that Richard uh, Dawkins effectively came up against that cliff, which we all know is there, mm. which is when what is true and what needs to be said is right at the point where it could screw everything in your life up. Mm. Not because it isn't true, but because you're on Al Jazeera and the entire Muslim world could be watching and you may very well discover you've got to leave your house, you've got to go away for a bit, you've got to go into hiding and worse. So I, I don't, I, it's a bit cruel that I mm. ridicule him and give him his examples because actually I think Richard Dawkins has done amazing work in all sorts of ways in his career. But I understand the slight reticence and it's a bit cruel of me to, to, to pick up on it when it has occurred. And I don't think it occurs so much now. But no, my main beef is with the people, the sort of Twitter warriors who uh, responded after Paris the other day by saying, the problem is all religions. Mm. And I, I think that's a cop out. Because I think you need to say, actually, you know what? The response to the load of jihadists, Islamists, going around Paris, gunning people down for being in a restaurant, uh, does not mean you've got to close like Anglican schools in England uh, that do a perfectly good job of educating kids. It does not mean you need to uh, uh, crack down on rabbis, uh, you know, in synagogues across Europe. In a way, it, this points to a deep, Deep, and a cowardice underneath, uh, underneath the cowardice in our time, which is yeah. that I think that it is you and Christopher and others made it possible to say all religions are untrue, all religions can be terrible. All of this is true. But uh, the, the thing is, in a way, uh, uh, you've also given people the ability to say we've got a problem with one religion at the moment. Mm. But I would say that there is one thing beyond that, which it's also important to consider that some of us still think, which is actually some religions are better than others. Yes. Yeah. You know, uh, Anglican Christianity, by and large, is a lot better than Sunni Islam. I mean, <laughs> you know, you'd much rather have the uh, local Anglican vicar come round to tea than your average fire-breathing imam. <laughs> yeah, well, that, and And... And we're very lucky, you know, that that is the case. And I sort of just think it needs nodding to. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm actually perpetually nodding on that point. And um, since the beginning, I have always been very clear to spell out that generic atheism doesn't make any sense. I mean, there, there is this bias, mm -hmm. a very strong bias among self-identified atheists that if you're going to be an intellectually consistent atheist, you have to oppose all religions equally because they're all equally mm. invalid. But this is just simply untrue. It's untrue uh, as a matter of fact, and it's untrue as a matter of moral imperative. So all, all religions are not equally improbable because any specific doctrine can be more or less at odds with what we know to be true about the nature of the universe. And if you keep adding doctrines to one another, your, your belief system becomes less and less plausible. So for, I mean, there's a very simple point I've made and to the confusion of, of many people, but you know, Mormonism is objectively less likely to be true than generic mm. Christianity is. Because for, this is a sure. simple statement of mathematical probability. It, it, mm. The Mormons believe mm. basically everything Christians believe, and they believe some additional nonsense. So, so, I mean, so yeah. whatever probability you put at Jesus's return to earth to resurrect the dead, you have to put a lesser probability on the claim that he will return to the precise spot of Jackson County, Missouri, right? As mm. opposed to returning anywhere. So, so, so the, the, the Mormons, the Mormons lose that probabilistic contest there. Yeah. And Wouldn't it be brilliant if the, if there were actually documentation saying that Muhammad had a conviction for fraud before pretending to hear the Quran. Too, I mean, I'm sure he did. I'm too, sure he did. We just don't yeah. have the paperwork. It's too bad we don't know as much about uh, Muhammad as we do of uh, Joseph Smith, no doubt. And and this, obviously, for uh, just across the board, this is relevant. So when I say that specific beliefs matter, that means that when I criticize the, the religious impediments to embryonic stem cell research, I'm not talking about Islam because Islam doesn't take mm. a position there. Islam has a admittedly crazy idea, but nonetheless useful idea that 
The soul doesn't enter the fetus until uh, far past the moment of conception, either day 80 or day 120, depending on which hadith you, you believe. And so the Islamic State could practice embryonic stem cell research, right? So mm. Islam is not a problem on that front. On that front, we're talking about Christianity and, and Judaism for the most part. But on every other front now relevant to the maintenance of, of civilization, Islam, political Islam, uh, jihadism is the problem we all have to focus on. And yeah. I will, and my concern, which I you know voice now, no doubt to the boredom of our listeners, they've heard me say it many times over, but perhaps you haven't heard it. My concern is that because of what has happened to the left, and because of you know the the narcissism of the small difference that just captivates everyone mm -hmm. in in polite society now, where as Mark Stein said, we are going to be talking about the truly trivial when nukes go off in some major American or European cities. My concern is that at a certain point, we will see only the, the far right in our own society become energized enough to call a spade a spade and right. address this the problem of creeping theocracy under the guise of mm. uh, the civil rights of Muslims. Um, could I, could I um, give another example of why that is? Um, this gets into another a point as I say it might be a point of difference between us before I get to a point sure. of, of similarity. I mean, I am very concerned, and this I think again, this is a matter of it's a transatlantic difference. But um, because Christianity in my country is not at the stage that it is in yours, mm. we have fewer of these interventions that hamper the public debate and indeed public science and various things like that than you do. Uh, it would be highly unusual now for uh, um, a Christian religious belief to significantly change any uh, debate in the UK. But there is something which um, I mean, the, the left-wing German uh, philosopher Jürgen Habermas wrote an essay mm. some years ago that I've often thought about and occasionally cited. It's called the, uh, An Awareness of What's Missing. Mm, yeah. uh, to my yeah. mind, it's one of the most important contributions to European philosophy in recent years. It's very short. But um, I think this thing, the, it describes, your listeners who don't know this, a, a, a funeral of a colleague of his in Germany, which is in a cathedral, a large church, um, and the coffin is there and various things are read from and said, but uh, it's not a religious service and there is no amen. Mm. And Habermas reflects on this and, 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 and the statement he believes his friend was making, which is that there is a, something missing in the modern European, let's say, uh, uh, West, which is a profound question mark that remains. And I, I, I think this goes to, I'll get onto the Islam thing in a second, but I think mm. this goes to a very, very fundamental issue, which the Islam thing is therefore um, uh, simply feeding on in a way, or its success is feeding on. Mm. Um, uh, um, another continental philosopher, sorry to be so specific, but a, 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 a wonderful French philosopher called Chantal Del Sol wrote a book in the 90s called Icarus Fallen, where she described modern European Western man as being in the state that Icarus would have been in had he survived the fall. Mm. And what she meant was, you know, we've tried in Europe, and Europe being, as it were, in political terms, and a much older continent than America, uh, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying so, but uh, uh, has been through so many things and tried so many things and had so many disasters. We've tried, ev we've tried religion. We've tried different types of religion. We've tried different types of politics. We tried fascism and communism and socialism and all sorts of other things. And at the end of the last experiment, which was obviously communism after it collapsed in 1990 in Europe, uh, at the end of that, European man found himself lying on the floor with his wings singed, and yet he's still here. Mm. So what does he do? Mm. All of the dreams have been uh, uh, shown to be uh, failures, but yet we're alive. And I think this is one of the most troubling questions, and I put it out there as a question, because you see, what, uh, 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 what is happening at the moment with the Islamists 
is yes, they have their own propulsion, and yes, they have their own uh, uh, um, uh, message and their own campaign and their own aims. But they cannot possibly succeed unless a, a society like European society is so deracinated, so bereft of things to want to survive and fight for, that it only will retain its comforts, only will fight for its remaining comforts, but ultimately is not able to defend itself. Mm. Now, that is the problem. I, let me give you one quick, this is a bit fatuous as an example, let me give you a quick example. Uh, the day after the massacre in Paris on Friday at the Bataclan Theatre, outside the theatre, where almost 100 people were gunned down at a concert, where the jihadists, the Islamists, lined up disabled people in their wheelchairs and shot them one by one, shot people in their teens, mm. shot people who were grandparents, shot people in the back and in the head, the most grotesque massacre in modern times in Europe. The next day, this man turned up, who always turns up after terrorist incidents, and he brings a keyboard and he plays John Lennon's Imagine. And all of these broadcasters and newspapers and things were quite taken by this again. People said how moving it was. And I think, screw that. This is no time to turn up with your ruddy keyboard and sing John Lennon. Imagine there's no countries. Yeah, OK, you don't need to imagine. They've been trying it on the continent. The Schengen Agreement erodes borders. John Lennon would have loved it. Well, so do the jihadists. Guess what? Free movement of people, free movement into the continent, free movement from North Africa and the Middle East into Europe, and then once you're in Europe, free movement wherever you like. They love that. Mm. We don't need this ruddy, utopian Leninism any more than we needed any other stupid ideology. But this weak, pitiful, uh, let's uh, change our hashtag, let's do a hashtag, let's uh, turn our Facebook profile to the trick of law. It's well-meaning, but seriously, seriously, that's not enough. Being mm. sad isn't enough. Being sad will stop no massacres. Being sad will not divert one Islamist. And you're right. The biggest challenge for Europe now is that people are losing patience with the political mainstream. Sweden, the party that's generally described as far right, which was nowhere in politics until recently, now tops the polls. Sweden, mm. France, Marine Le Pen, uh, uh, way ahead in the, in the presidential uh, um, race. This is happening. Even Germany, even Germany mm. is getting fed up with this. And this is the most serious problem going on on the continent today. Yeah, well, you, you said a lot there, all of it tremendously interesting. And I, I agree with virtually all of it. I, I, it sort of changes its shape when viewed through the lens of my own areas of uh, focus and expertise. So going back to the uh, Habermas essay, there is something missing. And this is, you know, this is something that I have been writing about really from the beginning. I mean, it was there in, in my first yeah. book, The End of Faith. Uh, and yeah. in, in my last book, I, I explicitly tried to focus on in my book, Waking Up, the, the subtitle is uh, yeah. Spirituality Without Religion. You know, I was trying to take the stink off this term, spirituality, so that we can... Mm. Uh, this, this is actually something that, that um, Hitch was also in favor of, although he, he viewed yeah. spirituality differently, but he, he didn't want to walk away from the word. But we, we have walked away from big and useful words like spirituality and evil and sacred mm. and profundity, and, and there is a kind of hollowing out of meaning and an attendant lack of conviction that is um, really not helpful at a time like this. And that, that void keeps getting refilled with mm. Iron Age philosophy and uh, tribalism and yeah. uh, the, the most bullying uh, forms of religiosity. And so in, in America, that is, you know, paradoxically, we have, we have much less of a problem with theocratic Islam for reasons that maybe we could go into, but we, we do have a, a real problem with Christian demagoguery and anti-science confusion. And so it's yeah. navigating this is a challenge because I, I absolutely agree that there is more to living a good and useful life and preparing oneself to die a, a good and noble death 
than simply mm. not believing any religious bullshit and being a fan of science, right? So you, mm. you, you can't get everything you want out yeah. of life by just criticizing bad beliefs and being scientifically curious, or at least I would argue you can't get yeah. everything you want. And this is not something I was planning to talk about in this conversation, but your remarks uh, just put this in my head. I, a friend of mine recently died, and um, he was someone who had a, a very unorthodox life. He essentially lived in a, a spiritual community. I mean, what, what would be described as a cult of sorts. But when it came time for him to die, uh, he got he's my age, but, but came down with cancer and you know, suddenly it seemed like a happy prognosis initially, and then suddenly t turned very dire. And you know, then he sent out an email saying he had he thinks 24 hours to live, and we all showed up to uh, have kind of final conversations with him. And what was striking about this experience for me is that I mean, here was a kind of a non-traditional form of it, but here was someone who he had, first of all he spent a, a lot of his life meditating and putting his own mind in order, and he. He was able to meet his death and relinquish his fear and attachment and everything else that would have made doing that with, with any sort of peaceful frame of mind impossible. He was in a really remarkable frame of mind when I last saw him and had a, an immense amount of support from this community. And, and they, there was a, you know, a three-day vigil after he died where his, you know, his body was just kind of lying in state and you know, covered with flowers and there was music and people coming and going and paying their last respects. And there, you know, they had their own kind of quasi-Hindu ritual mm. around this. But right. it, it, it was immensely powerful. And it was immensely more powerful than just calling in the authorities and whisking the body away Right. Uh, right. And or, or or swiftly burying him in the ground for circumstances like that, these private occasions where we have to grapple with the important transitions in life and the and just the mystery of, li of life and death. I think we need more than just thinking clearly about atoms in the yes. void. And um, yes. you can get more without believing anything on insufficient evidence. So that's something I, I yeah. argue for in, in, in many other contexts. But because the rituals and the institutions and the language that has given us uh, some ballast in those contexts have, have been explicitly religious for thousands of years, and if, if you want to think clearly about the nature of reality, you have to push back against religion to some degree it is just highly inconvenient that there are not obvious secular alternatives that have all mm. the power we need them to have at moments like this. And, and it's, incon yes. it's inconvenient at a funeral, and it's really inconvenient mm. when you're talking about societies of young people who are looking for meaning, and mm. you know all you can give yes. them is, is Lady Gaga on the weekends. Absolutely. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is one of the biggest challenges, is... Uh, um, and you see, I think that what is happening at the moment, certainly in Europe, is, I mean, I think it's a decline and fall situation, uh, which maybe could be turned around, but maybe not. And it's the mm. same for America eventually. And the question is, is that the, the, the pleasures we've had and the pleasures we've wanted to, to keep going with uh, it may not be sufficient to fight for. Mm. And it may be that uh, those pleasures are also something which only exist when economic times are good. Uh, it, it is a possibility that uh, um, whilst people have enough, you know, of a good income, broadly speaking, to, as certainly goes on in Europe, whatever your, you know, uh, um, socioeconomic status, you can, you can do, you know, things that our great grandparents have never dreamed of being able to do. I mean, travel, you know, uh, enjoy all sorts of fun, great experiences. Um, so it's possible that that some of this, that the, a mask for some of the things that we're eventually going to have to face has been that we've been living through economically pretty good times. Mm. If that changed, among other things, and it could change very fast, um, I think we would be f facing a different reality on this. And uh, but as I say, the crucial thing in the meantime is: can people, uh, 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 can such people even understand what our enemies want and that they mean it? 
I'm not sure they do. And I think that's why we've gone through this stupid decade and more of blaming it on things which it's got nothing to do with or very little to do with. Because at the end of it, we still, the, the, the secular European mind, secular Western mind in general, cannot comprehend that these guys actually mean it. You know, there's a very haunting story. I have a friend who was a journalist who covered the Beirut uh, uh, um, bombings in mm. the 80s that uh, killed almost 300 American and French uh, Marines. And uh, she said that one of the things, it was an early warning sign, one of the things that had baffled her at the time was that she spoke to a guard at the barracks gate who said that uh, he, he had seen the driver go through with the truck and the, mm. before he detonated. He saw the driver go through and he described the driver to her. And he said the strange thing was, this is a man here, I think he had a beard, unsurprisingly maybe, he had um, something else, but the crucial thing was, the man said, and he was smiling. Yeah, yeah. In the 1980s, you might have thought, what, what? Why would he be smiling? Today, if you don't know why, you haven't been paying attention. Yeah, that, that's a very difficult point to get across for people. And it's, it's a point I've been making, again, for, for 14 years. And it's a... Um, it's something I tried to get at. The irony here is that people like ourselves are often accused of you know, lacking empathy for, for Muslims in general and for even for our enemies. But here it's, it's a failure of empathy not to understand the motives of these people and the experience out of which these, these motives are arising. And these are acts of religious worship. Right. This is mm -hmm. given the requisite beliefs, given the certainty that paradise awaits martyrs, mm -hmm. that, that, that there's absolutely nothing mysterious about that smile. And it's on a continuum of highly energizing, quasi spiritual experiences that people have joining this kind of cause. Jihadists are within their own minds, essentially like spiritual James Bonds, right? They have all the fun yeah. of James Bond. I mean, all of that energy, plus the certainty of paradise, plus the, yeah. the, the ecstasy of knowing that you are aligned with God's plan for the cosmos. And you are, you're making common cause with your brothers who you are not afraid to see die because death is the whole point. Did you ever yeah. read Lawrence Wright's book, The, the Looming Tower? Yes, yeah, so, so he has got this amazing, yeah, the amazing scenes where he talks about how these these Al, Al Qaeda soldiers, you know, and this is you know now predates all of our present problems, but these Al, Al Qaeda recruits to fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan, they were trying to get martyred, you know, and and mm. weeping with envy, standing over a fallen brother who had just you know been mm. shot by a, you know a Soviet helicopter, and weeping with envy over his death because they knew that even at that moment he was you know in the arms of the almond-eyed uh, huri the, and, the virgins yeah and and th this it brings me to one of the one of the great queries i have about this which is that you spend a significant amount of your time ridiculing these stupid ideas and i spend a significant amount of my time ridiculing these stupid ideas but why are there so few of us who are willing to on any examination what you've just described is the sort of thing which every satirist, every comedian, every student, you know, in the in the in in the world, every every writer, every journalist, every thinker, every everybody at their mate's house on a Saturday night should be should be ridiculing out of the public sphere. But, you know, we live in this time where most people wouldn't even be willing to do that uh, in front of their friends. And they certainly wouldn't want to do it in front of strangers because it would be culturally insensitive. And that brings me back to the point I said before. Gradually, maybe people are going to say, screw that. Screw right. that. If you think that you, you blowing people up means you get to rape 72 girls on a cloud, then neither you nor any of your co-religionists are going to get a moment of peace from our societies. But the problem, Douglas, is that it, this is just a slight modification of the more benign version 
that sure. everyone is attached to and uh, takes the sting out of death. And I mean, everyone wants to believe in paradise. Everyone, wa- everyone wants to believe in heaven. I mean, by everyone, I say every religious person. And they don't want, if, if you are going to spell out all the reasons why a belief in martyrdom is obviously illegitimate, you have to cut much deeper than just it's not practically workable in a world where we have to live with mm-hmm. uh, competing religions. Sure, but yeah. that is possible. I, I, let me tell you a quick story. I mean, I, you see, I have this theory that, w- that, that what happened to Christianity over 200 years is going to happen to Islam in a very brief space of time. Right. Uh, maybe a few decades, maybe a few years, who knows? but that during that period, it's going to be unbelievably bloody Mm. because the Muslim world as a whole, including Muslims in the West, are going to hear things now that they had never heard before. And if if free societies were doing their job, we would be pushing that on. Instead of tiptoeing around, you know, after Charlie Hebdo, instead of walking around Paris with a pencil in the air, everybody would walk around with a cartoon of Muhammad in the air. Uh, yeah. After after the, the after the Danish cartoons affair, every single newspaper would run the Danish cartoons because they'd say, "Screw you! We are not uh, um, Muslims, and we're certainly not Islamists, and we'll publish what we like." And uh, and instead, we think we can help mollycoddle them uniquely among all religions and cosset them and keep them in cotton wool from the facts that are going to come their way one day anyway. Let me give you a quick example of that. There's an extraordinary man called Morten Storm, who um, isn't your average guy in all sorts of ways. He's a Dane. He uh, converted to Islam uh, 15, 20 years ago, converted to radical Islam. He was in prison. He was mm-hmm. in a biker cell and all that sort of stuff. And he ended up joining Al-Qaeda, as you do. <laughs> and um, uh, during um, his time, he ended up getting very high up. And he ended up indeed, in, indeed uh, knowing Anwar Awalaki, who was the preeminent Al-Qaeda preacher uh, before he was droned about three or four years ago. And uh, um, he was a sort of replacement for bin Laden, if there was one, mm. uh, in popularity stakes. Anyhow, he got to know Awalaki. Arguably, he helped lead the CIA to Awalaki because... Uh, Morton Storm ended up working for the CIA and uh, other intelligence agencies. Anyhow, uh, he wrote a very interesting memoir that came out a year or two ago called uh, Agent Storm. Um, but I asked him, I spent a couple of days with him some time ago, and I, I asked him, what was it that made you get out? I don't know if you know about this. Christopher was always interested in this uh, issue as well. What was the moment when a fanatic realizes their mind has changed? Mm. And I often ask fanatics when I speak to them, uh, 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 what it was, or former fanatics, what it was that made their mind change. And I've got all sorts of interesting examples of it, but the most interesting in a way was Morton Storm. When was it you knew you were out? When was it you knew that it was sort of over and that you might end up working for the other side, as it were? And he said that he was sitting, uh, waiting one day, I think in Hamburg or somewhere in, somewhere on the continent, he was waiting for an Al-Qaeda drop-off and they were late. And he'd already been having doubts and worries and all that sort of thing doubts about things people have been telling him about the Quran, about Muhammad, and things didn't seem to add up, and he'd, he'd been having doubts. And because the courier, the Al-Qaeda courier was late, and he ended up waiting a long time, and he had a computer in the apartment with him, and he was so angry, he sort of had revenge on them by, in his anger, typing into Google contradictions in the Quran. <laughs> and he started to read. Now, I think that that is happening all over the world, as we speak. It can't not be happening. Mm. We speak a lot about the people who go to Google and type in Anwar Awalaki, you know, best hit. But we don't actually spend very much time considering all the people who are getting online, are reading uh, the writings of critics of Islam and of Quranic history, which is becoming more mainstream, we don't listen or think about the people who are getting on and are reading works by you and others uh, and by Muslims and non-Muslims. And do you know why I say this is so particularly important? Is because the element of doubt can be the thing that is the difference between life and death in this business. Yeah. The element of doubt injected to the mind of the fanatic can stop them. 
Yeah, that, and, well, that's a point that Majid has made repeatedly of late. Just if you yeah. can just introduce, I mean, you imagine how committed you need to be to be a suicide bomber, and if you can yeah. introduce just one percent less conviction there, just a one percent doubt, you may in fact stop someone who, in other ways, may be a, 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 a still a totally repellent personality, but they're, they're sure. just not so convinced that they are willing to go all the way. And that's, that's and by that's the way. Difference. And by the way, there's 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 uh, uh, um, there's another failure on the part of our societies and our tiptoey attitude toward this and our our our, um, our fearfulness. Uh, there's now become some videos and things that are on the net trying to dissuade Brits uh, and others from joining ISIS. Now, I've said for some time one of the most disturbing figures is the fact that more British Muslims have joined ISIS in recent years than have joined the British Armed Forces. Mm -hmm. um, this is a striking and concerning issue. But when people have said, well, don't you think we should have an information campaign? You know, and I've been saying for years, you need a savage information campaign about this. You know, stop the, the, the uh, Muslim schoolgirls from London going because you'll have a video which says, you know what? You think you're going to go off and get some hot guy who's hot for jihad and hot for you and so on. No, you're going to end up being raped by a gang of people speaking a language you don't understand and your body's going to be discarded into a pit. Mm. That's what's going to happen. And uh, and we don't have the confidence even to say that, even when it's true. And I was speaking to somebody a little while ago who knew somebody who was a suicide bomber in Syria a couple of years ago. He was from the town of Crawley in England. And he was the first suicide bomber from the UK in uh, in Iraq, uh, in, in Syria, sorry. And he he blew up uh, uh, at a, uh, a Syrian government prison. And he was used for that purpose. He hmm. drove a truck into the prison, blew it up in order that some of the jihadis' mates could, uh, could get out. And there's a video of him uh, uh, before his, his so-called martyrdom yeah. in which he's standing there giving his video, but he doesn't speak Arabic, and the guys around him don't speak English. And he's standing there, and he's got his finger in the air, and he's doing all mm -hmm. of that crap. And, and I said to this friend of his, have you seen this video? And he said, yes. And I said, what did you think? when you looked in his eyes and his friend said to me, I thought he was having doubts. And I said, that was exactly what I thought. What am I doing exactly here? Mm. I thought I was going to get some hot martyrdom operation that would, they would sing Nasheeds about till the end of time. I didn't know I was going to be used to be put in a truck to drive towards a building for some pointless sectarian bit of a conflict. If I were your government or my government or any other Western government, I would pump that video around Muslim communities around the world and say, this is what you'd get. This is what you'd get. Mm. We, 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 nobody in our societies even calls these people out as the losers we should be calling them out as. Yeah, nobody, yeah. nobody, nobody's even willing to ridicule them. They're not even willing to cartoon or to or to write articles about these people because of the fearfulness. No wonder we're losing. And there are really two levels to that. There, there's the you know, the contradictions in the Quran level and, and the ways in which this, the ways in which the the doctrine is both self-refuting and stands in contradiction to what we know about the world. I mean, many Muslims, for instance, believe that. All of modern science is anticipated in the Quran, and it's, there are no yeah. scientific oh, errors God, there. The numbers right? of times I've had that row. Yeah. So, oh, so yeah, to, to hammer that into just to, to smash that into atoms would be a good thing, and also to point out the you know, what life is really like under the Islamic State and under a, a caliphate is is another. And there are many there are many ways in which we could disillusion people, but I, I think the crucial point that's implicit in all of that is that people actually care about what's true. And, and what, what is interesting on the left is that be, because they think people are not actually motivated by the content of their beliefs, they mm. think that, that you know, it would be hopeless to try to persuade someone otherwise because they're not being motivated by a vision of, of reality. They're not being motivated by an expectation of winding up in paradise with virgins. They're not being motivated by exactly. a concern that hell awaits those who don't live with sufficient fidelity yeah. to this doctrine. But the truth is, people really are worried about hell. You know, they th actually think mm. they're going to burn for eternity if they don't live by the specific precepts. And insofar as you can make that seem less and less plausible, 
you are doing the work of civilization here and, and yeah. very directly engaged in its defense. But the left, for the most part, is completely oblivious to this. And they just think that it's, you know, here we have people who have, have, they have purely terrestrial grievances based on the misuses of American and, and British mm. foreign policy and the, and the legacy of colonialism before all that. And of course, they hate us because we have divided up their countries and stolen their oil. And this has really nothing to do with, with religion. It has to do with the theft of mm. you know, all the world's resources by the 1% of us living yeah. in um, too close to Central Park or too close to Marin County or, <laughs> at, or um, Knightsbridge. And so it's... But this is, this is narcissism, though, isn't it? I mean, well, it's more oh, narcissism. And, and masochism. Among many boot, other yes. And masochism. Yes, it's all of Freud. Um, and, <laughs> I mean, they want the world's problems to be their fault. Because among other things, it makes it easier. And uh, as I say, eventually those people are going to have a hell of a shock. Um, as they say with a great joke, uh, what, what, what's the most troubling thing for masochists is when they meet a real sadist. Mm -hmm. right. Well, in radical Islam, in radical Islam, all of your lefty liberal uh, um, tiptoe uh, and uh, racist crying liberals have, have found their sadist. And I don't reckon they're going to get on much longer. Mm. Um, and I think what's more, that there should be a serious reckoning before then against these people who have tried to deracinate the public square in our societies, who want to talk about fake problems and ignore real ones, who want to police the parameters of the discussion of free people in free societies, and help out every totalitarian mm -hmm. and dictator and theological fascist in any society around the world. The people who migrate and flock to anybody as long as they're not a free uh, uh, person in a free society. Those people, I don't, I don't envy them in the end because uh, uh, the way they have done it, they are stopping people waking up in a decent way at a decent time. Mm. Let me give you a very quick example of that, if I may. If you look around the continent now, the, con the countries that are best equipped to deal with the problems of the mass migration crisis, of the Islamist crisis and others, are the ones which allowed a political discussion to go on because they allowed mm. the mainstream to mop up and respond to concerns of the public. The countries are going to be screwed are the ones that's tried to stop the discussion. Yeah, well, so but before you go there, because this is actually, uh, as you may know, uh, last week I went out on Twitter uh, asking our mutual followers for, for questions in anticipation of this conversation. And far and away, I mean, you know, 99 to 1, the, the most popular question for you was the migration crisis in Europe and just what we should all think about that. So I, I just want to acknowledge we're opening the door to that conversation. It, these concerns have, have certainly only sharpened since the events in Paris yeah. on Friday. So I want to end on, on that topic for as long as you want to explore it. But before we get there, I just want to summarize a point you just made, which, which was a point I actually made in, in a podcast I did yesterday in response to Paris. The thing that has to change, it, it seems to me, is that the obscurantism we witness on this topic, which has been so safe to engage in, and, and the charges of bigotry that get hurled at us for singling out Islam as an area of special concern. What has to happen is the balance has to swing, and that obscurantism has to become as disreputable and as costly to one's reputation as a real expression mm. of dangerous bigotry now is. So you, you know, if, if, yeah. you, if you and I were to start speaking in starkly racist terms here, right? We, just, mm -hmm. we, would, we reveal that we're racists and that we, we, we hate brown-skinned people. What that would do to our careers, right? Just the, the, the cost uh, of that would be enormous, and rightly so. There has to be an analogous cost to mm. lying and, and diverting uh, around this issue, because it, it is genuinely dangerous to confuse people about what is going on here. And I will only be confident that we're dealing with the problem when it just becomes that unseemly to be mm. uh, publicly confused about jihadism. So with that said, please, let's, let's uh, hear what you think about mm. 
the migration crisis in Europe and um, to what degree uh, recent events in France may um, impact that? Well, you know, the, the uh, it's a huge issue, which is import, impossible to do justice to. Um, Sorry to interrupt you again, but I, I should say that you wrote what appeared to me to be a very courageous article in uh, Standpoint, I believe, uh, mm. and, and our listeners should look that up. And in fact, I'll, I'll put a link to that on um, my blog where this podcast will be embedded. And this was an article I think you wrote, it was at least a month ago when, when the migration Two crisis. Two or three months ago. Yeah. yeah I mean, very, very yeah. early on when, when to worry out loud about this uh, had to have been tantamount to some expression of bigotry uh, for, for most people on the left. So it, it, it struck me as very brave and very balanced and uh, very early to be making these noises. And um, mm. so, so people should read that article. But, but now, please. Tell That's us. very kind. I, my view is now what it was then. I've been to the points of entry in Southern Europe, Italy, elsewhere, where migrants are coming. And there's a huge number of misunderstandings. The migrant crisis is not new. It's been going on for years. It's been at a high point this year, but it's also not a Syrian problem. It is in part a Syrian problem, but the Syrian component of the migration crisis is a minority part. The percentages differ, obviously, depending on which point of entry you go to. But we're not talking about more than 20, 30, some people said at some points, 40% of the migrants being from Syria. Most of the migrants come from elsewhere in the world, predominantly sub-Saharan Africa, Eritrea, other places. So there's a great misreading of what this is. And when people say, oh, well, we could sort out the situation in Syria and that would stop the migration crisis, they're flat out wrong. You could sort out the situation in Syria. I don't actually incidentally think we can. You could sort out, though, pretend to sort out the situation in Syria. What's your plan for Eritrea? Can you even point to it on a map? Mm. Most people have no idea what you're talking about when you talk about these countries. They simply say, well, Europe must take in the refugees or something. So the second point is, this is very largely and in the main not an asylum issue. It is not a refugee issue. It is an economic migrant issue. That is why the majority of the people coming, the vast majority, are young men. Now, I have no problem with those people. I have no contempt or dislike for those people. They are people leaving societies that are not as privileged as mine is. But I do not believe that the response to that is that my society owes everyone in the world who wants a better standard of living a home in my country. I don't believe it. And I think it's dishonest and disreputable to pretend that you do believe it. If people want to take in refugees into their homes, they should do. I, I admire those people. I admire people who exercise generosity. I have, however, unending contempt for people who expect other people to be generous on their behalf. And what we are seeing are people parading their sentiments over an issue that is far beyond simple sentiments. Mm. What is happening in the migration crisis is a vast and unparalleled migration of people Germany is saying officially it'll take in an extra 1% of its population this year and an extra 1% the next year after and the years after that. That's 800,000 people a year. 800,000 yeah. a year yeah. uh, with an 80 million population. Uh, Sweden is taking in the same proportion. Sweden is collapsing under this strain. The government's talking about having to put up taxes to pay for the migrants. They've run out of houses. They're having to put migrants in tents just as the Swedish winter comes along. The far right party in Sweden is now at the top of the polls the, uh, uh, and, and so on. And you see this everywhere in Europe. Europe cannot be the answer to the world's problems. I think myself that there is a way to solve this that is far more desirable. If it is Syria you're concentrating on. Help Syrians who are genuinely fleeing from the Syrian civil war to stay in countries around Syria, in the Lebanon, in Turkey, in any other country. It is always more desirable that refugees remain in the proximity of the country they're fleeing than that you ship them to Norway mm. or cart them off to Scotland. It, it, it makes no sense to do that. And another point. European leaders all said five and four years ago, 
that multiculturalism in Europe had failed. Angela Merkel said it five years ago, President Sarkozy said it four years ago, and so did Prime Minister Cameron. What did they mean? I think what they meant was that people were living parallel lives in our societies and that our societies were no longer, if they ever ha it had been in recent decades, successfully integrated, that we had reverse assimilation going on and so on. Why on earth, if multiculturalism had failed when migration was at a relatively low point, would it not fail when it was at a historic high? Mm. I think that the answer to this is that the politicians in Europe have been trying to follow public opinion, but the public don't know what we want. We want contradictory things. Only 7% of the British public in a recent poll said they want more migration into Britain. 7%. Mm. It's a deeply minority view. And yet the body of a young Syrian boy tragically washes up on the shores of Turkey. And Europeans are persuaded that the dead Syrian boy on the shores of Turkey is Europe's problem, mm. is Europe's problem. And so the European public say refugees welcome, or at least a proportion of them do, a minority do. I've always said that this was going to have a next turn of the wheel. The European publics do not want more migration anywhere in Europe. The next turn of the wheel last summer was the dead Syrian boy's body tragically washing up on the Turkish beach. And that caused a slight change in public opinion. But the next turn of the wheel, which I had been predicting for months, was what happened when the first refugee was involved in a terrorist incident. Mm. That's now happened. And I would predict that people who oversaw this insane policy are going to have a political uh, um, Goethe Damrung at some point. Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the European Commission, which tried to force quotas on European states earlier this year and force those quotas of migrants onto states at the same time that the European Commission said the numbers were not adequate, nowhere near adequate. Mm. Jean-Claude Juncker went on television last night and said that he did not like some of the talk of his critics about the immigration, and he asked them not to keep talking and invited the critics of the migration uh, a policy of Europe to, quote, be serious. Well, I would argue it was the critics of the immigration policy who were the only ones who were serious. It was us who was saying, if you take people in who do not come with passports or papers, what is your system for working out who they are, what they believe, and what they're going to do once they're here? There was no system. There is no system. If a politician wants to say to the European public, for every 100,000 people who come into Europe, maybe only 20 are jihadists. Mm. The European public can then work out 20 people, that's twice as many people as seem to be involved in Paris the other day. Maybe that means we only need to lose 400 people in terrorist shootouts every uh, few months or something mm. for the benefit of getting 100,000 people uh, from the third world. I don't think we're going to buy that. Mm. I don't think we're going to put up with it. The politicians are currently fighting for their political lives, and they will throw anything into the mix to survive. Well, that, but it is a horrible thing to witness. What's so strange about this, I, I don't know if you saw this, saw this article in the New York Times, I think it was last week, talking about a, a village in Germany that has only 100 full-time residents that was being asked to absorb 700 to 1,000 yes. migrants. And, yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, so those, absolutely. Let the, me give you another quick example. Malmo in Sweden which has been famous in recent years for becoming effectively a no-go zone in places for its Jews. There are only un just under a 1,000 Jews now in Malmo in Sweden. used to have a thriving Jewish population. Mm -hmm. They've been chased out largely by an uh, increasing Muslim population in the area and some very, very violent and unpleasant things that have happened to the Jews of Malmo. In Malmo, the remaining Jewish population, as I say, is just under a 1,000 people. More than 1,000 young Muslim men arrive in Malmo now every day. Mm. Who yeah. thinks? Who, who thinks, thinks that, works out that well, yeah. is a good idea? I mean, you know, this is the thing. This is the thing, Sam. I cannot understand, and uh, I don't mind whatever vilification comes my way. I'll keep on saying this. I do not understand it. 
every major mainstream European leader, unlike the American president, has said in recent years that the problem we face is of Islamist extremism. They've all said it. Hollande says it. Sarkozy said it. Merkel, Cameron, Blair, Brown, everyone says it. It's perfectly mainstream. And they recognize that it comes from a proportion, however small, mm. of the Muslim populations in your countries. The question I cannot get an answer to is, at a time when every mainstream politician admitted that that was the case, why would you allow in an unprecedented number of Muslims into your society? What's your plan? What was mm. the plan to change it? What was the plan to make multiculturalism work at this stage? Yeah. There well, was no plan. Well, that's, so, the, so there's is, literally... There, so uh, let's just linger on that claim. You're telling me there is, there is no process of vetting these people? I mean, I can't imagine what it is when you're talking about a crowd uh, you know, lingering yeah. on, on the, the border of you know, razor wire that's, that's been set up at the last minute uh, you know, in Hungary. But what is the process of vetting, however ineffectual? Do people just give their names and you put them on into some database and then hope to find out later whether or not they were Islamists? A lot um, claim to be uh, from places they're not. And there is a uh, market in uh, Syrian and other passports because they know that that's better to claim to be a Syrian. Uh, there are a lot of people who pretend to be children because they go through an easier process and so on. People clearly in their 20s and so on pretending to be uh, children. Um, and there are reception centers which effectively try to move people up and out of the point of entry on the Italian islands, on the Greek islands, and move them up as soon as possible into the rest of Europe so that there isn't the crowding that happened several years ago in some of these places. But no, an adequate system to work out who is who has not gone on. And what is more, once people do get in, they are in. Right. Nobody gets sent back. Nobody. Just to spare us, if possible, um charges of bigotry, given the short attention span of many people, though you started the segment saying that you, you feel for these people, have nothing against these people, et cetera, et cetera. Let's be clear about what we're, what we're talking about here. We, you know, I've said before that if we could vet these people, these people meaning the, the, the migrants coming from, from mm. all of these regions, in my view, the truly secular, truly liberal you know, liberal in the sense of wanting human rights and and, and being mm -hmm. tolerant of diversity, people coming from the Muslim world, these are the most important people in the world to support, in my view. I mean, they, I, I think these people should be made immediate U.S. citizens if they wanted. I mean, the only problem there is that we're now mm -hmm. pillaging the Muslim world of all of its intellectuals and all of the people it needs to establish some semblance of order there. So there's nothing that you have said just now and nothing that I would ever say is an expression of discomfort with brown-skinned people coming from North Africa or the Levant or anywhere else nope. coming to the, U the U.S. Or, or Europe. We're talking about the consequences of beliefs. And the problem yep. here is it's very difficult to vet people's beliefs. It's very difficult to find out whether the person who just stumbled out of a raft on Lesbos is someone who thinks that dying in defense of the one true faith is the best thing that could possibly happen to him, mm. right? Yeah. And if you just ask more, him, it's not necessarily a penetrating enough question to get an, a candid answer on. And what's more, go, go a level beneath that. Never mind the, 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 the case you just cite, which is obviously the hardest and the, 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 the most felt right now. Go a level beneath that. Go to the, just a simple cultural free speech change. I was speaking in Denmark uh, a few weeks ago mm. at the uh, uh, parliament in Copenhagen for the 10th anniversary of the publication of the Danish cartoons. And I, I spoke to a politician whilst I was there uh, who said they didn't want any more uh, Muslims arriving in Denmark. And they didn't want any refugees. They didn't want anyone from Syria uh, who was a Muslim. And I said, um, but, you know, isn't that a problem and, and, and so on? Mightn't there be some among them, blah, 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 blah. And this politician said, look, uh, if we take in uh, 10,000 people, for every 10,000 people, there will be, let's say, 7,000, 5,000, 4,000, 2,000, whatever number you want to plug, 
who don't believe we should have the right to publish what we think and to publish cartoons. Mm. So we don't want them. And if you look at, as I say, never mind the violence question, look at a, a poll that the BBC commissioned after the Charlie Hebdo murders in January. Uh, 27% of British Muslims said that they had sympathy mm. with the motives of the Charlie Hebdo killers. Another 10% said they weren't sure or wouldn't say. Of course, the BBC spun this and said it's a great, great news. Majority of British Muslims uh, 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 yeah. support uh, uh, against murdering cartoonists. But the point is, if you take in another 100 uh, 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 Muslims into a country, are you happy that on those kind of ratios, at least 27% are going to have some sympathy with people who want to do that. And actually, if they're coming from the Middle East or from North Africa, it's likely to be a lot higher. Mm. Are you, I mean, these are the questions that our societies need to ask and which, because of the people you've cited earlier, among others, and many others we could speak, we have not been able to have this discussion. And it may be very late in the day to start having it, I have to say. That's my main concern, that because it is so late in the day, it's obviously late in the day, we are facing a kind of emergency. And it's, I mean, it's very, every generation succumbs to the distortion of you know, looking through the lens of their present concerns and imagining that uh, mm -hmm. civilization hangs in the balance in a way that it hasn't in a very long time. But I really do feel that we are at a kind of turning point here on this issue, especially given how ineffectual and dishonest and disempowering the left has been. And I, so I, I really worry that if we continue to see attacks of the sort we saw on Friday, or if we had an event in, in the U.S. that was uh, larger than September 11th, which is absolutely plausible. In fact, I, I, from mm. my point of view, it would be a miracle if we avoid such a thing perpetually. Um, mm. you know, what does our political landscape look like after that? And I, I just, well, I feel that, I mean, given a choice between Noam Chomsky and Ben Carson, right, in terms of, in terms of a, 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 the totality of their understanding of what's happening now in the world, I would vote for Ben Carson every time, right? Now, Ben, sure. Car ben Carson, I think, is a dangerously deluded religious imbecile, right? I mean, Ben, ben mm -hmm. Carson does not, the fact that he is even a candidate for the presidency of the United States is a scandal. But at the, at the very least, I think he could be counted on to sort of get this right, uh, which is to sure. say he, he, he understands that jihadists are the enemies. And yet, you know, we have the, the masochism on the left that is so totally disempowering in the face of this and is just eager to destroy the reputation of anyone who will worry out loud about the dynamics of this problem, as you just did on the topic of migration. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm worried that the, the rise of the far right is now going to be another major story of our time. And I, I mean, I, it'll, it, it'll be the only answer, Sam. Uh, uh, it'll be the only answer in the end. And it'll be that, that because of the left. Now I'm um, aware of the pressing problem of the, the limits of the human bladder and the fact that you and I have been talking for two hours. So, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Let's, How do you know I haven't been believing whilst? Uh... <laughs> well, well, then you're you're more practiced at this than I. <laughs> so, um, well, perhaps we should close on that topic. Do you have any uh, hopeful noises to make on um, uh, how we might avoid that dynamic in the end? And and I guess well, you're speaking about Europe in particular. I've said for such a long time. Um, I'm bored of saying it. That uh, the point has always been to wake people up about this and to make them take it seriously in order that it wasn't left to the Jorg Haider elements or to Marine Le Pen in the future. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of making this same point, but I think it has to be made. And maybe the day is later than I thought. Um, but the only way to change that is for the mainstream on the left and on the right not to shut itself down, not to police the borders of speech, but to allow more speech, to allow more open and frank discussions about some of the problems in front of us. And if that could happen, I mean, I, 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 I rotate in my feelings about this uh, uh, and the left. I, sometimes I, I tease my friends on the left, particularly in Britain, where the Labour Party is now led by Jeremy Corbyn. Hmm. Um, I, I tease my friends on the left and say, come on, 
that's it, isn't it? It's game over. I mean, it clearly is. You've got a, um, a, a, the most extreme socialist and supporter of the IRA and friend of Hamas and Hezbollah as the leader of the left-wing party in Britain. And his press secretary is an unreconstructed Stalinist. And his chancellor of the exchequer uh, is somebody who wants to honor the dead terrorists of the IRA. Come on, it's over, isn't it? And some, sometimes I say to my friends on the left in the UK, you know, come on, admit it, you know. And other days I think I should encourage them to stay where they are and to fight uh, for their political corner. Um, it depends, as I say, from day to day. But, um, you know, as I say, um, it's the left that has caused a lot of this to happen. And when the left spent all these years flinging the term racist, against people they must have known were not racist, flang bigot at people they must have realized weren't bigoted. The only thing they've ended up doing, their only role in the dialectic, was to mean that if at some point, God forbid, real racists or real bigots came along, no one would believe them anymore. And that's the left's fault. They've set it up, which yeah. is why I say to hell with them, by the way, and why I don't care. Uh, I don't care about the left. I don't care about all these internecine wars on the left or the police coding or the speech coding or the, or the cis this or the Yale that. Uh, um, they're, they're not fit for purpose. Mm. Well, listen, Douglas, this has been a um, very rich conversation. It's great to have your voice on my podcast. Um, <laughs> it's a great pleasure, yeah. despite me ending on that somewhat gloomy yeah. note. No, well, I, I think it's it's. A, <laughs> well, we should also recall uh, that we are you know, seventy two hours after Paris, and and uh, certainly my mood, uh, no doubt yours, is colored by the recency of that event. So it sure it's, is. I mean, this uh, again, this is the problem of our time, and I don't think it's going away in our lifetime. Unfortunately, I, 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 in no. my last podcast, I said. I mean, this is just it's incredibly boring. I mean, that's one of the that's one mm. of the most toxic elements of this from my point of view. I mean, as you said, mm. you know, you uh, argue that you should be able to write a, an article about something you love for everyone you write about something you hate. And I feel the same way. And it, whenever I try to move on to other topics, I mean, I'm, I'm writing a book about artificial intelligence now and uh, mm. the, the philosophical and ethical problems uh, related to that, which are which are fascinating. and. Uh, I'm uh, building a, a an app for uh, meditation and philosophical reflection, and and uh, these are projects that I I'm very excited about, want to pay attention to, and yet you know ever since Friday my Twitter feed is mm. you know where the hell are you on this topic of uh, Islamism you know mm. we 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 need mm. to hear from you and and of course yeah. I have I feel like I I have something to say except I've all I can do is repeat what I've said a hundred times over, and mm. it, it is a an oppressively boring phenomenon that we are going to have to live with, hopefully at a distance. I mean, it's, it's well, you and I are quite lucky yeah. to be living in societies where it's it's not more dangerous than it is to have this conversation. It is a yeah, um, give it time, give it time. Well, that's again, that's what I I worry about. And uh, in the meantime, yeah, well, look, maybe if we plug away at this long enough, maybe if we do get those new people I was describing earlier. Uh, I can go back to writing about literature and you can go back to meditating. Yes. So my final word is inshallah. <laughs> yes, inshallah, yes. <laughs> you beat me to it. Well, listen, uh, it's been a pleasure. And um, just uh, to close, tell people where they should look for you online. Do you give us your, your, oh, yeah. your Twitter a, address? I've got, and I've got a uh, Twitter address, which is Douglas K. Murray, the letter K, Douglas K. Murray. And then uh, you can follow all my blogs and various other things at uh, the Spectator magazine in the UK, uh, where there's, I'm on part of the site. It's called spectator.co.uk. And um, I, uh, I, I put most of my thoughts on there. Great. Right. Well, I, I recommend you all do that. And a question about books, though. You, you, have, you, had, oh, yeah. a, you had an e-book on uh, this topic. Islamophilia. Uh, yeah. Is that, is that no longer available? Ah, Islamophilia is is part of a book I'm trying to finish at the moment, much like uh, your uh, your comment just now. Um, trying to finish and get it out of the way. Uh, it's a chapter of that, um, and it's uh, so it's 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 removed for the time being. But it was a uh, I was very proud of the fact that there's an ebook. It was um, a bestseller on Amazon US, UK, and Canada. That's great. And particularly proud of the fact that we massively outsold the Quran. 
uh, in the nice. uh, in in the bestseller lists. Like for ages. I mean, I know you're probably used to that, but uh, for me, that was a first. And I know that um, uh, Mohammed had a head start, but uh, it's always nice to catch up. Right, right. Well, that that was a great read too. So I'm, I look forward to the book that that's being worked into. It was it was also a very funny read, despite the the yeah. subject matter. So um, very kind. So okay, well, we we will uh, we will find you online. People will follow you on Twitter. They will await your next book. And um, oh, and yeah, and of course, and sometimes people you know sort of put up offensive things I've said on YouTube. But so you can catch me there as well. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, it, it is an honor to be fighting from the same trench with you, Douglas. It's um, I couldn't well, ask likewise, for a better company. Uh, so until next likewise. time. Likewise. Take care, my friend. Well, this is an addendum to the podcast delivered five days later. And I said a few things in this podcast that were gifts to my critics. I was aware of this at the time, but it's always interesting to see how far these people will go to mislead their own audiences about my views. Just to give you a taste of what's happening online, Max Blumenthal, the fake journalist, son of Sidney Blumenthal, tweeted the following quotation from my podcast, quote, I'd vote for Ben Carson every time, dot, dot, dot. He understands that jihadists are the enemy, end quote. Well, that ellipsis is obviously doing a lot of work there. I'd vote for Ben Carson every time. Okay, he tweeted that out to the world. This is just the digital death rattle of journalism. Uh, the fact that anyone on earth considers Blumenthal a journalist, including Blumenthal, that is just all the proof you need to understand that we are on the precipice of something horrible. And Cenk Uger did the same thing. He retweeted a meme about my intending to vote for Ben Carson. He also made a series of increasingly deranged videos about me in the last few days. Uh, he appears to be suffering some sort of breakdown. Um, but the problem is, of course, this works. I'm now hearing from people who say, you know, I've read all your books. I used to be a huge fan. The fact that you're supporting Ben Carson for president is a deal breaker. What the hell is wrong with you? Now, you do know how freaked out I would be if Ben Carson became the Republican candidate for the presidency. You know that, right? I can assure you that if he does, I will be far more articulate on the reasons why he shouldn't be president than Max Blumenthal or Cenk Uger will be. Okay. Now, do these guys know that they're misrepresenting my views to their audiences? Of course they do. This is conscious deception of their own audiences. It's amazing to me that their audiences don't seem to care about this when it's so blatant. But I should clarify something here. My remarks about Ben Carson and Noam Chomsky were simply a statement about how dangerously out of touch with reality the left appears to me on this issue. And I consider Chomsky the largest influence here. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of Chomsky's views. He considers himself an anarcho-syndicalist. Now, how that differs from Marxism, you're welcome to write your dissertation on that. Good luck. But on this specific topic, the threat of the global jihadist insurgency we are now witnessing, he's an anarcho-masochist in my book. All he ever seems to do is cite the ways in which the U.S. has been terrible. And some of these charges are true and some are fictional, but all seem to terminate in a kind of moral confusion and political paralysis. I mean, if aliens from outer space arrived tomorrow and began exterminating us, I'd half expect Chomsky to get on democracy now and say that we deserved it. After all, we've been putting out so much electromagnetic pollution and space junk, it's no wonder the neighbors are pissed. Now, in the last few days, many people have hurled quotations at me from Chomsky, attempting to counter what I said about him. But these quotations demonstrate no more than that he knows that jihadists exist and that they occasionally kill people. The explicit message of everything I've heard him say in this area is that jihadists wouldn't be killing people or trying to conquer the world but for the crimes of America. Okay? And that is a suicidally stupid thing to believe. To see where his head is of late, I just watched the first 10 minutes of a video entitled Noam Chomsky, colon, Media, NATO, ISIS, Free Trade Agreements, and Humanity. 2015, new. Okay, that, that's the title on YouTube. I just watched the first 10 minutes, but... Here, Chomsky can't even seem to figure out why we oppose Soviet communism. Okay, according to him, it was just a, quote, pretext for our own greed. 
Chomsky uses this with this term pretext all the time. Everything is a pretext. Every stated noble motive is always a pretext. Okay, any concern about human rights is a pretext. Okay, needless to say, our concern about jihadism is also a pretext, he makes clear in this video. My concern about jihadism isn't a pretext for anything but the maintenance of civilization. Okay, and this kind of self-flagellation would be disastrous if it ever came to power in this country. So the fact is, when it comes to dealing with the global challenge of jihadism and Islamism, I would take our own theocrats who recognize the problem for what it is, even with all their crazy religious topspin, over delusional leftists who don't. Now, you can disagree with me, fine. But if you are horrified that I could say such a thing, well, that just proves my point. Okay, I've been worrying for years that there will come a time when even atheists and secularists will back Christian lunatics because they're the only ones making sense on this issue. Now, we're not there yet, but if you are horrified by what I said in this podcast or by what Douglas Murray said, okay, and you think we are totally wrong about the left, well, great then consider us the canaries in the coal mine. We are living proof that people like Noam Chomsky and Glenn Greenwald and all the rest of the, these far-left critics of capitalism and Western power and U.S. foreign policy can seem so terrifyingly confused about what is going on in the world with respect to this issue that it's possible for a liberal rationalist like myself to prefer even the Christian right to them as stewards of Western civilization. Again, happily, we won't be faced with that choice in 2016. Okay, I'm sure I'll vote for Hillary. But Hillary, as you know, is derided as a neocon warmonger by the far left. Great, let's hope she stays that way. Now, it shouldn't surprise anyone at this point that Glenn Greenwald got into the act after this podcast was released. First, he noticed the New York Times review of my book with Majid, written by Irshad Manji. And apart from a couple of barbs that struck me as a little unfair which were mostly directed at atheists in general, and at Salman Rushdie and Richard Dawkins, and as well as at my fans, I liked this review a lot. Okay, I was grateful for it, and I spread it on social media, and I also thanked Irshad for writing it. Okay, well, it was, in fact, a very positive review. She ended it by calling Majid and me role models. What would Glenn Greenwald, a journalist, mind you, have you understand about the contents of this review? Okay, well, he seized upon a paragraph in which Irshad criticized my fans. And here's the quote. Even secularism's better angels have trouble defeating the tribal mindset. Last year, I attended a Sam Harris event where a crush of fans trailed him, mob-like, around the venue. Oi. End quote. And Greenwald, the journalist, this person is covering world events, right? Describe my fans this way while forwarding this quote on Twitter. The planet's creepiest, most tribalistic, leader-worshipping cult, end quote. It's not ISIS. It's not Boko Haram. It's not the Lord's Resistance Army. No, it's you guys. You're the planet's creepiest, most tribalistic, leader-worshipping cult, according to Glenn Greenwald. Okay. But Glenn wasn't done with me. He had a busy day over there at the Intercept. He then tweeted the following summary of what you just heard in this podcast. Syrian refugees, colon. Sam Harris defends Ted Cruz's, quote, preference for Christians over Muslims, end quote. Blasts Obama for objecting. Well, that's almost right, but um, it would take a Talmudic scholar to parse that accurately. Glenn knows that anyone who reads that summary will think that I supported Cruz's demand that we let in only Christians from Syria. And that's not true, as anyone who actually listened to the podcast could have told him. As I said, I think secularists and liberals in the Muslim world, and this certainly includes any who are fleeing Syria, should be given U.S. citizenship if they want it. I said these are the most important people on earth to support. How many different ways do I need to say that? My only concern is that we not let in jihadists or their sympathizers. The point I was making about Cruz is that if in the process of vetting a family from Syria, we determined that they were Christian, well, then that would cancel any concern that they might be jihadists. Is it safer to let in Christians? Of course it is. Okay, Cruz is absolutely right about this. But insofar as we can vet people, unlike Cruz, I think we should let in Muslims as well. We could be letting in the next Ayan Hirsi Ali or Majid Nawaz, 
or Faisal Saeed Amutar, or Sarah Hader. These people are absolute heroes. I mean, Glenn Greenwald isn't fit to tie their shoes, and he's not making their lives any easier, I should point out. The kinds of things that Glenn Greenwald says and writes here materially raises the security concerns of just these sorts of people. And I acknowledge in the podcast that the problem of vetting refugees appears to be quite different in Europe than it is in the U.S. at this moment, which is a good thing for the U.S. So if you came away from this podcast thinking that I want to abandon the Syrian refugees to the chaos of Syria, you're completely mistaken about my views. But we have to be able to talk about the kinds of concerns that Douglas raised. And if we're just letting in people by the millions in Europe without proper vetting, no one should be surprised when we discover that a significant percentage of these people resist assimilation and have attitudes about free speech and women's rights and gay rights that are deeply problematic and, in fact, antithetical to our own. And Europe is going to have to deal with that. And they've done a terrible job of it so far. And Douglas's only point is, what makes you think this job is going to get easier if you let in millions of more people fitting this description. And that's, you know, we have to stop walking on eggshells around that problem. And cries of racism and bigotry from the left is causing all the good people to walk on eggshells and leaving a space that can only be occupied by the real bigots and xenophobes and fascists and neo-Nazis. And again, this is, this is especially a problem in Europe. And Douglas is absolutely right if... If Europe ever makes a hard turn toward the right politically, it will be because of how the left handled this issue. And while I recognize that the U.S. is in a much better position here politically than Europe is, it's still conceivable to me that we could eventually find ourselves in the same situation. And it would arguably be worse in the U.S. ultimately because the far right here is generally synonymous with Christian theocracy in the making. If, if, if you have to think of a plausible scenario under which we would elect a true Christian lunatic to the presidency, someone who actually believes that the prophecies in the book of Revelation will come true, their true record of the future given to us by God and are likely to come true in his or her lifetime, well then, it will be because of how the left handled this issue won't be because of gay rights or transgender rights or global climate change. No, the, the left's failure to deal with the increasingly obvious security concern of jihadism will be what opens the door. At least that's the only path I can see. And it's all too plausible given the likelihood of future terrorist attacks. So, as I said in the podcast with Douglas, we have to prepare our political landscape for the virtual inevitability of those kinds of attacks. It will be a miracle if we avoid them entirely. And Muslims, above all, have to anticipate this. Muslims have to want to prepare the political landscape to absorb these shocks. And denying the problem, shrieking about Islamophobia, leveling charges of bigotry at everyone, including ex-Muslims and Muslim reformers who are trying to tackle this issue, okay, that is ostrich-like behavior that could well end terribly for all of us. Finally, in the last few days, I posted an interview on my blog entitled Sam Harris, the, quote, Salon Interview. And this was actually a Salon interview, but as you'll see, it, it was an interview that, that only furthered my conflict with Salon. As many of you know, I've had a boycott uh, of Salon and uh, encouraged my readers a couple years ago to ignore Salon, given how badly behaved they've been journalistically. And uh, I'll let you read it on my blog, but what happened is I agreed to do an interview with Salon, provided that I could have complete control over the words attributed to me which is to say they wouldn't edit what I said at all, and that I could say anything I wanted to about Salon. And they agreed to this, we did the interview, and then they cut everything I said about Salon. And as uh, my friend Jason Calacanis noted on Twitter, when, when you're doing an interview about your own integrity and you 
cut everything critical said about your integrity? That doesn't speak very well for your integrity. So what I did is I published the whole exchange on my blog, and I left in the part that Salon cut out, and that's highlighted in blue, so you can you can see that. And many people found this very instructive. Many people can't believe how a website like Salon operates, and there are many of them now, but you know Salon is the most prominent and I think actually the worst because it often reprints material from alternate, which is the bottom of the bottom of the abyss. But as you'll see, I, I turned the tables on Salon in a way that really worked out. I, in fact, I, I couldn't lose because in agreeing to do this interview, either they were going to have to publish my criticism of the magazine or they were going to have to cut it. And then I would point out that they refused to publish my criticism of the magazine. So it was really a no-lose situation for me, and um, that's why I did the interview. And um, I also got a chance to say many of the, the same things I've said in podcasts like this about the left and about jihadism, but it came out in a uh, unusually complete form. It's a long interview, and so I, I would encourage you to read it because I think it's probably, at this point, the best statement of my views on, on these topics. And the interview was done before the Paris attacks, uh, though it came out after. So you should know that as well. Anyway, I, I hope not to be in the habit of having to add addendums like this to podcasts in the future, but this one seemed worth doing. And uh, once again, thanks to uh, Douglas for taking the time. And thank you to all of you for listening. Until next time.